less provocative. We will say it like it really is. With dignity and respect. Committed to free speech and common sense. Upbeat and entertaining. Straight talking and direct. We may educate each other and you. Heartfelt and passionate. Thought provoking. Provocative and controversial. Fearless and truthful. Welcome to The Pledge, the programme committed to straight talking. We know waffle when we see it. <laughs> In this show, June's spoiling for a fight. Graham's giving his PE kit out of lost property. <laughs> Michelle is talking about the most difficult decision of all. And Emma has some choice words for the sisterhood. But first, it's my turn. You see, I have a degree of sympathy for Takayuka Tanuka, the father who threw his seven-year-old son Yamota out of the car in a remote part of Japan inhabited by black bears as a punishment for throwing stones. After a few minutes, Mr Tanuka turned the car round to pick up his duly admonished son, only to find the boy had wandered off and got lost in the forest, and he wasn't found for six days. Now, I understand why Mr Tanuka didn't tell the authorities what he'd done to start with. He obviously felt ashamed. As it turned out, dumping his son was a pretty dumb thing to do, but how many parents haven't been tempted to do something similar at one time or another? I'm not sure I'd go as far as this, but we've all done stupid things on the spur of the moment, only to live to regret them. As a result of the incident, Yamota became a national hero in Japan for surviving for six days, and his father a national villain, who cost the authorities thousands. So in Yamota's case, Throwing stones paid off handsomely. Well, Greg, I actually can't believe that you feel um, any sympathy for that nutcase of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you drop your kids off in a forest where there's bears? I mean, I've got three children and they've really, really annoyed me at times, but I would not let my kids out of my sight, especially leave them in a forest with angry bears. So I disagree with you no, no, you're being unfair to the bears. The bears weren't angry. <laughs> the bears don't necessarily attack human beings. They just disappear. But, I mean, have you never felt like that? Have you never felt... God! Feeling like that and actually doing something about, about it is two different things. And my three kids, honestly, are a challenge. They're still a challenge. But I would never... I must be one of the most paranoid mums out there. I would never leave my children for a split second, especially throw them out the car and drive off. I mean, what was he thinking of? Well, I know we all make mistakes and I, know, well, I, I, I am thought, not an angel. I thought I'd be almost alone in having some sympathy for this guy. But I see that a poll taken in Japan shows that 20% of the population thought it was appropriate punishment. No. Appropriate yeah. from the point of view that the son, what the son did was, was deemed as, as sort of, well, you know... Well, he was got to scare his son. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a pretty dumb thing to do, but, I, you know, you can see how parents get there. The, the principle... Like, like, what's the, going on in the world in this day and age? Mm. Um, you know, yeah. you, you shouldn't be doing that. I'll tell you what, I'll take you in my car and I'll drop you off in the woods. It's <laughs> <laughs> scared of bears. Well, yes. no, no, no. bears. <laughs> the thing is, I learned, I learned as, a, as, a, as a parent um, that if you don't... If you threaten your children with some sort of punishment, you've got to be able to see it through. And I learned that very early on, because I used to make sort of wild claims about punishment to my young children. You know, if you don't come downstairs now, I'm going to take all your toys out of your bedroom and set fire to them in the garden. And then I realised that I couldn't actually see that through. Did, so, you, did you try it? No, oh. no, and they knew pretty early on that I wasn't going to do that because it was me that had bought the toys in the first place, probably, <laughs> and they know what I'm like. But the fact was is that it sounds like he got a little bit carried away with the situation, was clearly pulling his hair out, decided that it would be appropriate punishment to scare his son, and it backfired. So he's one lucky man because it didn't Very end lucky. in tragedy. But at the same time... Completely agree with Michelle that you can't, yeah. you can't yeah. ever let your children be put in that situation, can you? Someone last night, a mate of mine, that I was doing this story today, and he said, "I did that." And he was up in Scotland, and he was driving along the road, and his kids, two daughters, had driven him nuts. And in the end, he said, "Right, stop, both of you, out of here, we're going." And he dropped them both up and drove off up the road. That's all this guy did. Now, he was lucky. He went back right. and they're both still there. One, I think one of them was chasing up the road. But Greg, but, it's slightly different because with your friend, I mean. 
Again, I, I agree with Michelle and Graham. There's no excuse. But at least with your friend, there were two of them. This is a boy on his own in the forest. It's madness. Look, it's not just insanity. It's not justifiable, but you can understand. You can understand response. it, but still, there's no excuse. Wh where's the mum in all of this? Was the mum in the she, car? She was in the booth. So what? <laughs> <laughs> she, 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 she was in the car. <laughs> why is why the dad got all the blame? Well, because I don't the mum is obviously a part of this yeah. as well. Well, you did know? you see the dad's? I mean, the, at the end, the dad, you know, said terribly sorry to the nation and terribly <laughs> sorry to his son, and his son standing there like a smug yeah. little, little boy. Yeah. <laughs> a smug going like this, and you think, and God, all... you've lost control of him for life. For life. <laughs> <laughs> How much police time did all this take oh, as well? Oh. And I, I think, the, pa I think the, the parents should be charged for it, honestly. What, you uh, think there should be criminal yeah, charges? I think they should be charged for it, yeah. What, for neglecting their child? Well, you don't throw your child, a small child, out your car and leave them in a forest with bears. <laughs> <laughs> you, even if he's throwing rocks at cars or whatever he was doing. Yeah. Well, you know, there's other punishments yeah, that I think there are they could other have looked ways at. Punishing I think, your child. And Come I am, on. as I said earlier, I am not an angel. I'm not the perfect mother. Uh, we all have challenges with our kids every single day. But I wouldn't throw my kid out in a forest with bears. It's well, madness. And I can't believe that you think that you feel the I, slightest bit of sympathy well, for that man. I, I, I just... <laughs> no, I just can feel, understand how he felt at that moment in time. So have you lost control like that with your children? Have you got He's lost some children. <laughs> I've lost control like that in, in television studios. Talk about in, what, you've in, dropped off some presenters no, a, in the middle as of the As a woods. producer, <laughs> it does like, for God. No, we all have moments like that, I think. That's how Bear Grylls got his brain. And that's why I think there's, there's, <laughs> there's no point saying to this, to, to them, prosecute, we're going to prosecute you for what you did on the spur of a moment. I but mean, that's obviously, what happens, if the though. child, if something had happened to the child, I mean, the father must have, and the mother must have had a terrifying six days. Well, I so want to know how he so so I want to know how the child yeah. survived. Well, like, he was severely he dehydrated, yeah. wasn't he, when, when they found him? He, he did hungry, manage to drink. He hadn't eaten for six yeah, days. Yeah, and he, he had found, found some rainwater or tap water no, or something. He but... found a shed and a mm. tap. Mm. But it's, it's sort of, you know, tough love. Part of parenting is tough love, but that is taking it to the extreme, isn't it? And I it think is. that... I don't know if, you, if they... I presume they could be prosecuted. I don't know if it's ongoing. So you didn't smile when you read about it? Yeah, but smiling in the sense that relief... After more they found anything. him. Yeah, After exactly. It was more a sense of relief yeah, because yeah. I think the chances of that boy surviving the time that he did... Were, 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 was There'll incredible. be a film made out of it. There yeah, that's be. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Quite, quite possibly. But it was... Uh, it, it, well, it's just, it's just one of those things that, you know, we've also got cultural difference in Japan as well yeah. where you know, there's a different view of authority and there's a different respect culture. So maybe, you know, in the context of that, he felt that... that what he, what he was doing would scare the boy and he'd go back, pick him up, and all would be good and there'd be no more stone throwing. But Which probably would have worked if the boy Not hadn't now. wanted off. <laughs> now the boy's going to be now leaving boy, him in the forest. Watch him every time he's got a stone in his hand because he'll be um, lethal. Over the floor. How, how, would, how did you discipline your children? If that's not too personal a question. Um, Will you tell us, Greg? My wife was a lot tougher than I was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's a bit like my, my father was... The same as me, really. My father was used to this. I mean, <laughs> I mean, lovely man, but my mother used to say, you'll wait till your father comes home, you're going to be in trouble. No. No, <laughs> no chance at all. My father was the softest man you ever met, and I'm a bit like that. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't have um, sort of done anything as extreme as... I would like to think I wouldn't have done, mm. but as I say, I understand the emotion he felt. Look, let's really scare this kid. Let's put him outside. We'll go to up the road and pretend we've left him. <laughs> Not a good idea. There are lots of other ways to punish your children. And leaving them in the middle of the forest isn't one of them. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's my turn next. Muhammad Ali was known as the greatest. Not just for what he achieved inside the ring, but for what he fought for outside of it. I'm asking whether the absence of struggle has brought us to a modern era of mediocrity. When you consider what our forebearers were able to achieve without the technology and resources of their modern counterparts, I think you can only conclude that our comfort and distractions have delivered decadence and decline. In 1783, William Pitt became our youngest ever Prime Minister at the age of 24. He led the country to recovery following the defeat of the hands of our American cousins and victory in the Napoleonic Wars. He even found time to advocate the end of slavery. But he wore himself out and didn't make it to 50. Today, 24-year-olds are more likely to aspire to Justin Bieber or Harry Styles. But they may also wear themselves out before they reach 50.
for entirely different reasons. So I say, give us adversity and struggles, because without them, we will never be great. This is the oddest piece of nostalgia that I'm hearing from the lips of June Sarpong. Give us that sort of struggles. The type of struggles that Muhammad Ali was fighting against was the deepest, most entrenched racism you can possibly imagine. I agree. Why are you pining for a time where you needed to have people who had to say, I won't go into the army to fight this war against Vietnam because I'm treated worse on my home turf than by a foreign country? Why on earth? Are you pining for that? I am not pining for that. And maybe, Emma Barney, I'm being a little facetious. Well, I'm here to unpick your facetiousness with my own. Please do. But what I would say is when you look at the, the sort of heroes that we created in the past and you compare them to modern day leaders, it's a joke. So you who know, do you not rate in modern day terms? I think I would say a lot of them because there's a difference between brilliance um, somebody who's exceptional or somebody who's extraordinary to somebody who's great. And I think part of the reason that there was such a sort of an epic outpouring when Muhammad Ali died or when um, Nelson Mandela died is because we know we've probably seen the last of those sorts of truly great men. But we've probably seen, I hope, in the mm. Western world, the developed world, yes. the last of those sorts of battles where that required really those men requires people yeah. to take such extraordinary stands. Yeah. And equally, with the ushering in of a more gentle, equal and fairer society, Perhaps you do lose some of that fighting spirit in some of the leaders that you're talking about. You don't get wartime leaders in peacetime. No. But what I would say is you also get better behaved people in their own homes. Yes. If I may put this forward, and it's not too soon after mm. the death of the great man, mm. Muhammad Ali had several illegitimate children. He also used to go on tr programs That's like... Got nothing no, to no, do but hear me out on this. Yeah. People's private people. lives now mm. are very much in the tabloid press that didn't exist then. They mm. are also all over Twitter all over the time. Mm. You used to hear from these people very infrequently mm. and you wouldn't know anything about their private mm. lives. It doesn't have anything against his racial struggle, but mm. what I would say is the world that he lived in mm. was a very unequal mm. society between black and white and between men and women. Mm. And now everybody is expected to be working towards a very decent standard in their private and but professional I, but lives. But what I would say, that the, the danger of it, and don't get me wrong, I am all for a fair and equal society, of course. I had heard that. Yes, you had <laughs> heard that. <laughs> but the danger of it, it means that our standards for for the people that we celebrate is so low. It's not, I don't think it is a case of being low. I think it's just more subtle. I think, the impact, low, I think the, peop, the, the impact of people's achievements aren't measurable on the same scale. To Emma's point, mm. that the divide was so big that if somebody really stood out as, as confronting that anti-establishment or, you know, dealing with, with rights, it, it was, it took, it, it, on the face of it, it took so much bravery because they were making such great leaps. Mm. Whereas now, I think, success is, is th there's less of a divide, therefore success and greatness is measured on a different scale. So Pope Francis, for instance, mm. you know, I'm not a particularly religious person, but what he's achieving within the Catholic Church is immense, immense. absolutely immense. He's trying to bring it into a more modern era. But he, you can't give him the same recognition because the scale of what he's achieving isn't, isn't as, as great. great, I don't think. And yet but he also, you struggle. can't, you can't. Yeah. Society every so often throws up somebody who is very special, mm. but there are many of them. You, I mean, the ones you've, you've, you've picked out two from the 20th century, <laughs> and they really are. There's quite a few I more. mean, what's interesting, I think, about Ali mm. was that at the time, I mean, I was around at that time, at the time... No, when, you were. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, <laughs> I, sadly I was. At the time, he was condemned, massively condemned in the United States for his, for his position on, on race yeah, relations, um, yeah. for for becoming a Muslim, mm -hmm. for uh, his position on Vietnam. Mm. Um, Fifty years on, he's the hero, they're the villains. And it's quite interesting that over time, when society has moved in that direction, which it has... I mean, no-one in America today would defend Vietnam and what they did no in way, Vietnam. No way, not at all. Nobody. But I don't think that, the t that there is anybody as, you know, to sort of Graham and Emma's point, that requires that same level of bravery. And that's what I mean, but that you, we don't see that level of excellence anymore. You can't anymore. tell now. I you can only you tell in 50 and, years' time. Do you Greg, think? I think you and Greg should be putting a naughty corner this week. Because <laughs> I, I have to say to you, what's your point, caller? <laughs> my, I just don't get your debate whatsoever. I don't get it my, at all. My point is, 
Okay, let's look at the people that we're celebrating now, Michelle. Give me some names. They're not that impressive. That's what Are I'm you saying. Politically, yeah, that across we're, the we're board, no, like, uh, people that we would consider leaders in general. They are not that impressive. But he was and an that incredible is... sports guy. He's completely different. If you if you want to celebrate politicians, you know, they're, they're never going to excite you. But even you, the even the politicians of the, of today don't really compare to you know. We're not going to have a, a Lincoln in modern times, are we? And that's what I'm saying. But, but that's because, because we've that. moved on and, and we don't fortunately have to try and solve all those issues that they had to solve. Well, I've got then. a clip of Muhammad Ali for when he stood up against the Vietnam War and, 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 and refused to fight. So um, let's have a quick look. They say that actually every time that I enter the ring, in a way, I'm going to war. They say to me daily, you are a prize fighter. What's the difference? And I like to say to those critics of the press and to the others that there is one hell of a lot of difference in fighting in the rain and going to war in Vietnam. My intention is to box to win a clean fight. But in war, the intention is to kill, 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 and continue killing innocent people. I mean, it's, it fascinates me, obviously, a sporting icon talking about politics. Exactly. And, and where, I, where I sort of understand a little bit of where you're going, although I don't agree with it, mm. is, is the fact that if, you've got, if you compare it to modern sp sporting stars, very few of them have a political viewpoint. Most of them they've think... Got, no, they've got lucrative contracts. Though. Exactly that. <laughs> Most of them got. think... And, and, and could you say that with politicians as well, to an extent? They, didn't in, the they they've... didn't in the 1960s. He was an exception. That's what made him different. And, you know, you go through that period, and there are odd people who, mm. who by the circumstances they found themselves in, became, as you say, great. I mean, Church, if you judged Churchill yeah. in 1935, you would have thought... This is nothing special. By 1950, but look at who he became. you would have seen him as a great but man. People really? want to speak out because I think we live in a negative I mean, society. Who, mm. who now well. would we compare to those men and well, women? But I think to the point, we're talking about history. Yeah. And, you know, if we're looking back now, I think what you're saying there about you know hindsight is very important because actually I don't want to sanitise Muhammad Ali. You know, mm. I was just having a chat before I came on. He went on the Parkinson show and said black people should only marry black people. Don't dilute my race. You know, he said some oh, things to you. Yeah, that was a bit. But extreme. I don't think you want to hold him up. Well, no, history is selective. <laughs> no. History is selective. You know, but we I'm do sanitise him. people mm. as well. We yes. do. I, I get your point there. And you know, there were a lot of things that Muhammad Ali said that I didn't agree with. But that does not take away no. from the fact that he was a and, great man. And where I will he was agree so with you, so courageous. Character. Where I will agree, I've got to give you a bit of help here. Thank you. Where I will agree with you is, I think, and this is to to your point as well, Graham, is that people today are too scared of how they will be judged. Mm. So they are watching what they're saying. They are looking at because who's paying them for this, for social media. We're becoming contracts. more and more vacuous. And, and, and I think that actually, when we sort of look back 50 years from now, we will say that this was a bit of a, a nothing time. The other, the, other, the other point is, I think that there is so much celebrity culture. So, somebody does something tiny and they make the front page, they become popular takes a picture of themselves very on quickly. Instagram, a selfie. But it's, it's, Are you kidding me? It's sort of it's something you can't sustain over a period of time. No, but, but out of all of those people will be one or two people yeah. who, when you look back in 50 years' time, you'll say they were great people. Yeah. Do they achieve great things? But isn't it, isn't it more worrying that we do actually still have some very important battles, like the lines between poverty yeah. and being able and to live OK in worse. this society yeah. Yeah. are getting worse. The yeah. polarisation between those at the top and those at the bottom yeah. has never been mm. larger. Yeah. Mm. We have issues that are actually, in a way, much more entrenched, have mm. always been there and are getting worse. worse. Where are the leaders for that? Where are the voices? Look at somebody That's like my Angelina point, Jolie. Emma. You know, she she is a she is a. a yeah, any, but you can't compare. I'm not Angelina saying that, Jolie but the work she Mother does, she Teresa. stepped outside of her comfort zone to True. fight something that a cause that she wholeheartedly believes in uh, and does incredible stuff. Now, to Greg's point, will history judge her as somebody that is iconic of our generation? You know, because I'm of a what big fan achieved? of Angelina Jolie. I mm. I completely respect her. I've interviewed her a couple of times. I think she's a phenomenal woman. You what cannot, else? darling, <laughs> um, but you cannot compare her to an Eleanor well, not Roosevelt. Yet. Not yet. Not yet. OK, well, you don't know. we'll see. And my, also, I think Michelle's right. We live in a negative my, time. I'll we end do. with yes, Ali. My funny, please. I thought I read all the stuff on Ali, and I thought mm. the funniest line I saw was when he... Because, you know, he hated flying. Yeah. And he wouldn't put his seatbelt on. So the stewardess said to him, <clears throat> put on your seatbelt. And he said... I'm Superman. I don't need a seat. <laughs> and she said, Superman doesn't need a plane. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so actually, well, the best line go. was the yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Well, we're going to stick with sport now for, okay. for, for, for my subject. So, um, a study says the NHS should perform ten times as many gastric band surgeries as it does now to tackle the UK's obesity crisis. That's a thousand surgeries a week, over 50,000 a year. This is absolutely crazy. I can't believe we're actually recommending that people go under the knife with all of its risks. The answer to me is obvious. It should be about prevention rather than cure. We need to change the law to force children to do more exercise. I'm amazed that there's no national minimum time that schools are required to give PE. The school day shouldn't just be about learning English with Professor Dyke or chemistry <laughs> with Dr Sarpong. The school timetable should look like this. PE every day. 45 minutes of it at the very least. Mm. That's four hours a week. It's not complicated, it's common sense. And it's the answer to our obesity crisis. Well, yes, to an extent. <laughs> but I do remember, and when I went to school a long time ago, there, you did do an awful lot of PE. It was compulsory. And I always remember the... And the, for the kids like you, mm. who were, you know, very sporty, it was great. For the ones who weren't, it was pretty miserable. The number of people I used to see, you know, who would slide off, who went on the, mm. the run and hid behind the tree, the people who, who, even if they tried, couldn't achieve it. So if you're going to do it, you've got to do it in a way that is inclusive of everybody. Uh, and not, not that you turn some people into stars and others are just completely ignored. Absolutely agree. You've got to define what physical education is within school. And at primary school, it's got to be an experience that children have that is positive. So it's not about creating elite athletes... From, from a school PE system, although obviously there has to be that has to be factored in in terms of children that are very good at sport, but actually getting out and doing stuff, whether it's going for a walk for 45 minutes or a small jog or getting to know your environment a bit, oh, there should be on. something. You two are being so goody two shoes yes. about this. Your point was brilliant, so you started getting on board with his <laughs> inclusive sport. Right? You know, Michelle, I know you feel very strongly that everyone should get medals still, and we don't need to water down from the previous episode. <laughs> Yes, no. it needs to be in there because you need to have the habit. That's yeah. what you're saying. Absolutely it needs right. to be habit forming. Yeah. And yes, you don't want people quaking behind a street, you know, sort of tree with an egg and spoon going, I don't want to go <laughs> down there. But you do need them to move. And if you're going to move, the only thing that's going to get you going is fear of God or competition. And mm. in your day, and I'm sorry, you know, I do think it's changed, there wasn't fried chicken on every single corner of British no. high streets. There were shops. I agree. The world and so that's what's games. changed. I agree, yeah. but the idea that exercise at school is going to change all this. Is, well, it's it one will. part of a whole programme. I mean, look at the number coming. How many footballers of your generation mm. do you see now? Now, they did exercise every day of their lives. They're incredibly trained. And you look at them in their 40s and 50s, and some of them are pretty large. Yeah, some of them are. No, and and again, I think that, that goes to Emma's point, that there's, there's lifestyle choices you have to make alongside it. So yes. not, there's not one single solution to, to sport. But unless you embed it in children at a young age, it's a habit they're never going to form. Yeah. They're never going to get it. Yeah. And I think that we, we undervalue sport, and we have done for generations. Most primary schools, or a lot of primary schools, don't even have a dedicated PE teacher. No. It's, mm -hmm. some teach, it's a teacher putting themselves out to do something for the sake of it. Two hours is a required, or a required, a required standard, um, but it's not um, enforced. And this is the only opportunity a lot of these children are going to get to actually exercise. Yeah. So I think it's absolutely fundamental to someone's education and upbringing to have some sport in and school. And it's that's as important as maths and English and, and all of the other su um, subjects that we put such an emphasis on. I think at the end of the day, uh, your as long as you can involve everybody. But why can't you? I, well, I, I don't understand why you can't. I agree with you, Graham. I think that it starts with education. It starts with fit fitness at school, but it also starts in the home as well. Educating the parents that, to get rid of all the sugar uh, sweets and bad fatty foods and everything. And I, I agree with the sugar tax. Um, because, you know, being fit does help you. And mentally? Mentally yeah. as well. I mean, I've lost... I know it's not about me and this is about a children's debate. <laughs> Are you sure? But I've <laughs> lost eight and a half stone. And it's completely changed my business outlook. And, and a half stone. Yeah, yeah. Look amazing. Uh -huh. that's a whole person. Yeah. And I, you know, I run every day. I go to the gym every day. Well, I, I broke my foot recently, and I had to calm down a bit, little bit. But I do agree that it makes you a completely different person. Mm. It makes you positive. We've got to get rid of the negativity 
in the country and make people more positive, make people healthy, make people fit. But do you think and it's it the role of the government to do it? Is, I do, it I is. absolutely it do. Absolutely well, I have to believe it is, but, I mean, in, but that absolutely. does mean you maybe stop having... The, the fire chicken shop on every corner. Maybe no, you don't have a, McDonald's but that's in a large different numbers. Argument. Maybe. That's well, a no, different it's all, argument. It's all going to be part of it. Yeah, if there's you're a few. Stop it happening. It's one of the hardest things to solve because it's about people's freedom, right? Mm. We want to give the people freedom. Then they go and earn the money, and they should spend it however they want. However, if all they can see around them is, you know, that cheap food. That, I, listen, I was really into sport at mm. school. I was all right. I wasn't amazing. I was on the netball B team, OK? And I was a very good goal defender. <laughs> and I used to go every Saturday, and then I'd play tennis in the summer or whatever it was that we switched to. And then I got to university, and I stopped. Just started drinking, mm. eating whatever, definitely put on maybe two stone. And then, I, and then when I went off to do um, to more qualifications to become a journalist, I had to walk everywhere there. So I actually lost loads of weight naturally. But my point was... Even for me, who was into sport, it wasn't habit-forming. And it's the first mm. time ever I've thought about the fact that it's called physical education. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yes, I got taught how to play netball. Mm. Yeah. But I don't think it was put into my head by anybody that this is a programme for life. And I think that is what's missing. And Absolutely. And you have, have an opportunity... Make... Sorry. sorry, you have an opportunity when somebody is young to, to get them... Engaged in something that Which you become second nature. because they've got time yeah. at that. You know, when when you go to university, mm -hmm. when you go to work, your your time for you and your time for sport and, and activity is going to be under less. so much more yeah. uh, not, not pressure. Not at, not at university, God. But I you know, you've got all, all the time in the world. We're all missing a very very big point here: is that when we were all young. At school, it wasn't that long for me, it was a long time for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we were all involved in sports and we were going out at night and playing rounders and, and playing, you know, all these different We didn't sports have video games. We didn't have video games. We weren't I on did. social media all yeah. the time. Oh, we weren't sure. taking selfies and everything. And I think we have changed. <laughs> we're, we're not as active as we were. And we're under, so well, but so also we're under, make, we're under a lot more food change. strain as well yeah. because of the, the unhealthy lifestyle. So, so the gastric band quote that I gave you in my introduction. I mean, that's about the current obesity crisis. So you wouldn't but, give people gastric bands. Well, it's, it's. It, I, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't, but on the scale as, uh, 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 that we're talking about here, fifty thousand a year. I mean, operations come with complications, with great costs. So, of course, there are people that are, are sort of uh, uh, are so unfit and have such uh, health issues um, due to their size that that actually getting them to sort of start some sort of sport is going to be very difficult. But as and Michelle said, she, she you know she lost eight stone because she something. Half. Eight and a half stone, I sorry. I missed that half. Yeah. That was the hardest <laughs> bit to lose. That's yeah, well, hard half, so. but, but, but the fact is that you need a trigger to motivate you to doing something. You need a target. You need, you need to be familiar what with about something. What with you? With sport. Why did you... Not, not the football side of it, but why did you first get into physical illness? Because I was very lucky. I had, I had good sport at school. Mm. Really important, yep. the amount of sport well, I played, I played at school. You. My parents lived a very outdoor life. I grew up in Jersey, so I had outdoor space. So everything for me revolved around the outdoors. And again, our, you know, our, our environment is under pressure. School sports field have been sold, school sports fields have been sold off for, for the last yeah, 30 flats. years. We know that, you know, yeah. so, so there's so much pressure on us. And it's, this is why I think it is important government get involved yep. and fund it properly. It so starts that we actually off with have... education, and that's why NHS is bursting at the seams. And if we don't start it with education, in the schools, then we will never be solving the issues. OK, guys, I'm next, and I want to talk about the most difficult decision a person could ever have to make. I feel strongly that assisted suicide should be legalised. If someone is terminally ill and needs help to end the pain, they shouldn't have to worry about their loved ones being put in prison. Of course, we'll need checks in place to make sure that the person is fully able to make such an important decision. But it's their right and no one else's to decide if their life is no longer worth living. Michelle, I completely disagree with you on this one. I think it is not our place to play God. The fact that 
the people in question are terminally ill in itself says that they are eventually going to die. Mm -hmm. So it's not our place to speed up that process. A lot of the time, these people are in a place where maybe they are not mentally capable to decide whether or not they should live or die. And at the end of the day, we don't know what happens when you die. So we actually don't know if it's going to be better for them when they leave this planet. So um, for that reason, I completely disagree with you. And I think it just opens us up for complete exploitation. As I, a, as I said, June, that mm. we have to make sure that the person is fu fully understands. So, you know, if they're not all right upstairs, then they don't have do to make the decision. That? Well, I think there's got to be a process. I think that if they're in tremendous pain and it's a terminal il illness, then they should decide on their life. They should be in charge of their own destiny. And it's between them and a doctor. And the doctor um, looks after them and they decide together. And then, of course, they need to discuss it with a family. But at the end of the day, the family shouldn't decide because we don't want, you know, I'm not saying that people will get into trying to do their insurance or anything like that, bump them off mm. so that we don't have to pay for their, mm. their old, you know, mm. home, uh, the carer's home. But I do believe that if someone's terminally ill, like my dad, my dad was 36 when he was confined to a wheelchair and I love him to death. And my dad suffers every single day um, and he takes about 15, 16 pills a day. Now, luckily, he still has that quality of life. He still has his grandchildren and it would break our heart if he ever, ever decided that. But you never know, there might come a, a day where you know, he just feels that all the quality of his life has gone. And I think that people can go to Switzerland, they can pay for it. So, so why can't people who can't afford to, to do it? It's a slippery slope, Michelle. It's, and also the problem, the problem with society today in general is we place so much focus on the external, on the physical. There is another form of life which is also the internal and actually when you're not somebody that's able to move it means you do have to focus on your, on, on your internal and becoming more mindful and I just think when we start sort of deciding whether or not somebody should live it's absolute but it's not for you to decide society. it's for them to decide but it's not for them to decide either <laughs> we are all gonna die at some point uh, I... yeah, so would you want them suffering and pain I think but we don't know that decision. they're not going to well, be I, suffering I when they die. Specific. No one knows my, what happens. My mum died last year at 100. Wow. But in her 80s, she said to me, look, Greg, if I go gaga, I'd like you to give me the pills. Mm -hmm. And she did. She, the last five years of her life had no... Uh, there was no... She wasn't living, really. She had mm. very serious dementia. And what was the point? And yet, um, and I think if my brothers and I had had the choice, mm -hmm. we'd have all voted to say, yes, let's, let's give her the pill. But, mm -hmm. And that's what she wanted. That's what she said she'd wanted. But we couldn't do it. And I, I often think the, the problem is not when people are able to make the decision themselves. It's when they're not able to make the decision. They're living a life that has no value, even to them. My mother would have hated the last five years. If she'd known what it was like, that she'd have hated the last five years of her life. But she would have hated the last five years with the perspective of who she was before. We don't know no, what's she'd... going on in their minds when they're in this state. Well, you'd... And also, we I don't know what do. happens when you, you die. How do we know it's better, but to I'll... be honest? Well, my mum wouldn't have thought it was better. My mum did, I don't think, believe there was an afterlife. I'm, she, I just think she wouldn't have wanted to live like that. I mean, I think and one, I would have gone along with it, it's except one, I couldn't do it. It's one sort of case when you're dealing with age. I think it's a very different case when mm. you're dealing with somebody that has had an injury or motor mm. neuron disease. I don't know if you saw Simon's Choice, the, uh, mm. the programme on BBC Two, which was, I thought it portrayed the struggle between the conversation we're having and, mm. and, and what that couple went through and the family went through. Um, incredibly well because it, it, it gave a very balanced argument to, to both sides and I think if you if you are in control mentally mm. of your situation and you feel that you've suffered enough or that what, what is happening to you is is taking a turn that you do not find unacceptable there is a there's a legitimate question to ask is it somebody's human right to, to end their life and whilst people in, go to Switzerland and go out of their way to 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 end their lives we accept that because a lot of people don't get prosecuted. Most people don't get prosecuted um, for, for, for that. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of letting it happen without 
legalising it. The issue is nobody wants to legalise it. If you look at the, the history of this and, and the bills that have legalized. gone through the Commons, I mean, the last one was uh, in 2015, last year, mm. 118 MPs voted for it and 330 mm. voted against, against it. Yeah. You look at the case, I personally was very affected um, and, and have covered this this story of Tony Nicholson, mm. who, who had locked-in syndrome, a very fit, physically healthy man, and he and his partner, his wife, Jane, fought extremely hard. They took their case to the European mm. Courts of Human Rights, saying, this is actually in contravention mm -hmm. to my human rights. He was able to communicate through this uh, limited way of speaking, of saying, I am in hell. Yeah. So when you say we don't know what's going on inside, even somebody with locked-in syndrome is able to communicate they are in hell. And you, you can't see a man like that, a sort of a six-foot, over-six-foot guy, you know, crouched over in so much pain. It's, it's killing his wife, it's killing his children. They were ready to let him be peaceful. And that is inhumane, actually. You know, that's agree. very hard. But that's very hard as well, because I think what Michelle also spoke about, which doesn't necessarily get enough attention when anyone has this debate, is the, is the pressure on the family to think I could be prosecuted at a very stressful time as well. I mean, June, I know you're saying you disagree, but. How could you look at a family like the Nicklinsons? Mm. He has passed away now. Mm. But how could you look at a family at that point and yeah. say, you can't give him that right? How I could look at a family like that is, is knowing that we are all going to die at some point. We know that. This is a man who is unwell, so therefore his journey to death is quicker than the rest of us, though, you know, one never knows. But nobody knows for sure what happens when you die. So, so how do we why know it's that better? Man, why should that man go through all because that Because there pain? is a natural process to life. There's I mean, a natural process to life, on life. And, and that's saying because you're in pain that you no longer have something to contribute to society, which is absolute mm. rubbish. And Canada legalised it where they're rubbish. offering a doctor um, to assist as well, but so I, Canada has legalised it. But only for Canadians, so you can't But I, yeah, I think Absolutely. doctors um, at one time used to... There was a degree of flexibility. Before Harold Shipman. Before Shipman. Yeah. And Shipman changed it all, because yeah, if you're yeah. a doctor, you're scared to death yeah. now. Mm -hmm. to give, and you should To give be. the extra boost of morphine. Mm. Yeah. You see... This is you taking the decision. You're saying your, yours is Not to do with something to do with afterlife or something. Surely, if somebody's position in life is such that their position that they are in such pain, or they mm. feel so helpless, who are you to say they should? One of, one of the one of the Not one of the sort of sorry. I think points from what June's arguing <clears throat> is is if you if you create an unnecessary burden on the individual, and there's plenty of cases where where somebody has felt that if, if assisted suicide was an option, that they may feel an extra burden to, to take that option. But so, so we have to, as you're saying in your, in your intro, it's very important that the process of deciding process, yeah. is, is absolutely vital because that, for me, is the worst situation that you can have if it was legalised, is that, that people will think, well, my family is suffering, I owe it to them to, 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 to sort of end my life. And that equally is an unfair burden on that individual. Michelle, let me ask if you, if you don't mind. You know, with, mm. your, with your father, yeah. and obviously a very young age for whatever happened to him yeah. that happened. If he came to you and he said, I'm done, you know, have you had that discussion as a family about how you'll approach that? No, 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 because my dad is really happy. He suffers a lot, he suffers in pain a lot, but. His grandchildren and his family keep him going, and he's still got a quality of life. Yes. If he was to come to me and the, and the family and say, you know, the pain is too much now, I'm deteriorating, and he is deteriorating, you know, that, that's life. Mm. Um, I want to end my life. I would be heartbroken. I would try and make him change his decision. But you want him legally to have day, an option? My dad, June, is, he's in charge of his life. Which is he, fine. But that's fine, then. Because That's he it. can make that and choice. I would have to just but if you accept his decision. When I used to go and see my mother in an old people's home mm. where the quality of life for an awful lot of them wasn't very good, my mother didn't want that. She'd have hated it. And I've come out and said to my kids, look, if there's any chance of that... Now, she, is not, she was not in a position to make that decision for herself. But, Greg, don't you think... And we think, couldn't make the decision for But don't you think that is no. because of how we design our old people's homes? No, we design no, them listen, in a way that says nothing, that these people have nothing there, to contribute there was to society. Nothing, no, no, there was nothing wrong with the home. This is a lot of people who are... Someone explained it to me one day and said, your mother is dying, she's just taking five years. And it would have been far better for her 
if she hadn't taken five years. We don't know that. I, I disagree with you. Well, I can see why legislators won't take the decision. They won't take the risk. Won't and take they the shouldn't. Risk because the, you've only got to have the one or two stories that are all over. Yeah, that are all, well, not even Harold Shipman, the, the, you know, the family that decided to, mm. to get yeah. rid of Granddad yeah. because it, it, for the inheritance, for the inheritance or, whatever. or yeah. something like that. But, but there'll be the, that'll be a very small number compared to people who said, I don't want to live like that, so please, yeah. can you make sure I don't? Well, on that, it is me after the break, and I will be moving this on to tell you why we shouldn't be going back in time. women. Really, I do. I want us to be happy, safe and go lucky. What I don't want is for us to be segregated like some weird group in need of special attention. So why on earth has Glastonbury, the closest this country comes to hedonism on heat, believe me, I should know, sanctioned its first ever women-only venue? Created by a group unsurprisingly called the Sisterhood, this area will apparently offer live music and, rather ironically, workshops on inclusion. Billed as a secret space for women, the producers say women-only spaces are necessary in a world that is still run by and designed to benefit mainly men. What absolute nonsense. Gender-segregated dance floors are the preserve of countries with terrible human rights records. Think Iran and India, not Britain. This country is about blazing a trail and not going back to the Dark Ages. Forcing women to change their behaviour to accommodate prehistoric tendencies is an admission of failure, nothing else. Gender segregation, with very few exceptions, has no place in our society, and certainly not in the fields of one of our most gloriously liberal summer parties. So, secret space for women, segregated, weird group, that was all in your intro. It was. Was that a description of Woman's Hour? <laughs> <laughs> that you present very on? Very good, very good. There is a men's hour as well. No, that's fine. I'm glad there's a men's and hour. There's that's also right, called Radio 5, the is football it? Industry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I actually agree with you, despite my joke. I, um, I agree with you because I, I was reading a few months ago about the possibility or the the introduction of segregated carriages on trains in a in a town in Germany. And I know that Jeremy Corbyn has touted the idea of segregation, and I think that's fundamentally wrong to progress. It's a backward step. Um, but I have to say, in this particular instance with Glastonbury, who was it who pro prompted that sort of uh, this, this women-only segregated space? Well, I think it's space? these women who've come up with it. They're a collective. It's in the Shangri-La field. I'm sharing a lot of knowledge about Glasto. I don't remember most of my experiences <laughs> in the Shangri-La field. Um, and they've talked about it being an inclusive space for everybody who identifies as a woman, so there's some trans issues going on in there. I sort of see all of that. However, can you imagine if men set up a male-only zone within a music festival? I mean, it, there would be complete, and rightly so, uproar. I mean, when we're going now to the space, you brought up sport, or I brought up sport, about the idea of no longer may maybe having sport segregation in terms of male-only golf clubs. We're looking at that in yep. sort of the wider world. For me, recreational spaces are about us all coming together. And if the sisterhood, whoever these, these women are, are really about inclusion and really about equality, we have to make men part of the conversation. Absolutely, well, uh, Emma, absolutely. And I think they should be renamed the Muppet Group because <laughs> I, I am furious about this. I, I think that we're going backwards in terms of equality. And I just feel if it's a safety thing, then I totally get it because it's a drunken environment, everyone's partying. I'm not sure and I do it's with safe. That, though. But then I can see the point of to you know to prevent rape, etc. But I think it's mental, absolutely absurd. I mean, we're trying to campaign, as you say, some of the golf clubs in the UK to allow women to go into them, and then we're we're starting to we're going the opposite, and we're saying, hold on a little second, we want our own bit here. So you know, guys should get their own bit too. We're trying to come together and work together, and I think it's it's appalling. Well, I'm sorry, disagree with you both there. Okay. So, in sort of normal situations, I would agree with you, Emma. I think every day. every day situation. When it comes to Glastonbury, 
the reason Glastonbury is so filthy and gross and disgusting is because of the men. Oh. So I'm oh. sorry, so I want a women only tent <laughs> that will be clean and won't have gross toilets. So for me, I'm all for this and <laughs> I, I'm going to have my own deck chair. Unfortunately, I can't go this year because of the referendum, but I will be there next year with my deck chair in this clean, lovely women only tent in uh, the Shangri-La field. You met some of my friends, they're some of the dirtiest <laughs> campers. <laughs> There is no guarantee of cleanliness. No, no, hang on a moment. Okay, I, I, Gross! All right, you toilets. Were you there we do like gender you? segregated toilets. No, but they're still near each other. That's too much for me. Okay, hang so on. So I'm all for this L tent. Coming back to the safety <laughs> point, because it's an interesting thing that, that you mentioned there, Michelle, because in Cologne, obviously, over New Year's Eve, yeah. we saw some terrible outbreak of mm. sexual assaults mm. en masse. And then Cologne is also famous for this carnival. I've never mm. been to the, this carnival. I need to work my way over there. Mm. But the carnival that then followed a few weeks later, the police, in all their wisdom over there, decided to create women-only safe spaces and introduce more lighting. Now, how many people do you think they caught from that night in New Year's Eve who actually perpetrated those attacks? It's like under 10, mm -hmm. right? How about we have better policing rather than segregating women and making them change the way they behave yeah. but, for the way men but are? But I don't think Glastonbury is about safety, though. It's not about safety. They did say it's a secret space but where it, you can be. But, it, but isn't it also because, unfortunately, when you look at the statistics of how many women actually perform at most festivals, it's something like there are... I think 72% of the bands that perform at festivals are male. So I do think it's more because of that issue. But if we're going back to safety, the stats are, what, 64% of women feel that they've received unwanted sexual attention in a public place. So there are two arguments here. I don't think Glastonbury's about safety. It might, I think Glastonbury's about inclusion. But I think Glastonbury is... The, the, the example is And showing, cleanliness. But it, <laughs> OK, I'll tell you, so are my really awful female friends who aren't that clean. But, you know, what, I don't, what I'm trying to say is I think there's a bit of a trend. You know, Corbyn bringing up this idea of let's go back to segregating to make women safe. Let's go back to having this because it's a male-designed world. You know, we need to be pushing beyond mm. that, and I think it's a absolutely. A and, and also, it excludes. Trend. What it does as well is it, it excludes decent men. That's mm. the thing. I, if You're I speaking about yourself, if, well, I'm not like in that tent. I want you in that too, tent. Greg. Mainly, I want in that tent because there's a DIY workshop. There is. I need to learn some because I'm useless, and you said you're useless, so I, maybe you I, can What do you me. think? You Greg? might want the nice toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the fact that. is, the serious point is, is that if you've got decent, law-abiding, responsible men that, that respect women, if there's a situation where a woman is getting is feeling abused then a lot of those guys will, will step in and, 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 defend, be, and, and yeah. help defend them. And mm -hmm. I think as soon as you create segregation, you're isolating people and you're making, you know, good people feel that, that what their contribution is isn't good enough. Well, before yeah. I came on today, I, I consulted the feminists of my family, because <laughs> uh, I've always been surrounded by all these... Strong um, women. Bolshy women. Mm. And uh, strong women. Strong. <laughs> no, like, I'm trying to make it that you can go home tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Helping you out there, Helping friend. Well, you out. well my, my, my daughter said to me, Dan, just keep out of it. He said, you can't win joining in this debate because wow. you're a man. <laughs> and I, so I thought, well, then I asked my wife, who said that she thinks the whole thing is ridiculous, but the position you mm. take. Does it really matter that much? Does it really matter? Does it really that matter? I think it really I, does And matter. I'm not sure it does, just for that. If there's a bunch of women who happen to want to go into a tent... And only hang out. Well, 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 hang out together. Feminism Why to not? New heights. I don't care. And mm. I'm all about helping women. I, I mentor in business over 80 women, all about their confidence and everything else. You know, we've been fighting for years regarding the golf clubs to, to let mm. us into some of these clubs. So I think that... I, I just I think it's appalling we're going backwards. Well, I mean, I did say in a few exceptions, because obviously there will be times where you do genuinely, like there are obviously women's charities that look after specific <laughs> women, women issues, in yeah. an issue, yeah. Yeah. like there are men's charities. Mm. I mean, equally, I happened to go to a single-sex school. Mm. So did I. That, for me, personally, worked well. Me too. But I also know for other girls, it didn't. So it's not like I'm not a product in some way of being segregated at times. It's just where I feel it's a slippery slope is where we have one rule for men and say, you get rid of all your male-only clubs, but on the left, because this is probably able we to be typified like that, we want to have our cake and eat it. And I'm not saying it's, you know, something that we need to put onto the agenda in a big way. I know you're bored of talking about Brexit. Um, but it is something that I think is worth discussing as a theme, because I see it popping up. Well, ideally, you wouldn't want it. 
Mm. In a world, yeah. in, the, in the world well, we we'd all like to, we'd world. like to be part of, yeah. you wouldn't want it. But if a group of women say, look, I feel much better if I can do this. Fair enough. I wonder, we care? I wonder if, um, if Glastonbury felt pressured into accepting them as well, what the rationale behind it was. Because if a group of, this, this group, of, if they're quite powerful, the if they're lobbyists, if they're, you know, the, the, you just wonder whether or not they've said, right, this is what we want, and Glastonbury have gone, OK, we better say yes, because we don't want any negative publicity. Well... We've given them a bit, and we've given them some positive as well. But they lose sound great, and um, I'm not going to go to Glastonbury this year because I'm now scared the sisterhood are going to hunt me down. <laughs> but we have done our best to spare you from it. But let's be honest, there's only one word on everyone's lips. Let's talk about Brexit, baby. Let's talk about it individually. Let's talk about all of the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about Brexit. Let's talk about... Let's talk about Brexit now. To the people that hope for in the crowd, it keeps coming up anyhow. Don't decoy the void or make void the topic because it's not going to stop it. Now, we will talk about Brexit on the radio and TV shows. Not together, together but alone. On our own. Let me tell you how it is and how it could be. How it was and how it should be. I would love a head to head debate without time. He could be Dave, I could be nice. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to. Whatever. Let's talk about Brexit, Dave. <laughs> That's what I know you're sick of. Where are all the women, June? We're here. There's just no women in Let's Talk About Brexit. So anyway, that is it from us. Send us a tweet to tell us if we're talking sense or not, or if you've got something you think we should be debating. More straight talking next week. Hello, I'm back on the pledge next week. Can't wait. I'm wondering, is next week the week that I'm going to finally agree with Jun Zapong? Doubt it. Hi, so I'm just doing some shopping before my appearance on the pledge next Thursday. And um, I've decided that unlike Baroness Moon last week, I think I'm going to wear something that covers me a bit up here. So see you then. You catch me just getting ready to be the uh, only man on the pledge next week. And I'm taking special precautions.